and and there's, I, I'm always attracted to those stories too of of these other dimensions where things are happening that affect the rest of us. So it's just anything that the embassy puts a stamp on and says, that's my pouch. Everything about North Korea is fascinating because it goes against what everything you, you believe or everything you think if, if, about how the world actually works. So Bradley, if, if you wanted to encourage people that the world isn't completely dominated by these forces of dark money, can you make that case? My name is Jay Newman, and I'm your host for the Under Money video podcast, where we discuss the intersection of power, people, and money. And it's an enormous pleasure, in fact, a great honor to have uh, with me today Bradley Hope. Bradley Hope is a uh, former investigative journalist with The Wall Street Journal. He's the author of one of the best books I've ever read, uh, the Billion Dollar Whale, which is a story of uh, political corruption on a scale that um, we've rarely seen revealed. He's got a, uh, a more recent book, uh, The Rebel in the Kingdom, about uh, North Korea, which I think we'll get a chance to talk about. And he's also the co-founder um, of a, an amazing journalistic studio known as Project Brazen. Uh, and Project Brazen, we'll talk about that as well, but he's investigating uh, everything from how the uh, Saudi royal family works to how the Middle East works in general to what is Havana syndrome. Uh, and uh, I know we'll get a chance to talk about that. But Bradley, I just want to thank you again and congratulate you. Billion Dollar Whale reveals how the world works in a way that we rarely see. And I'm, I'm fascinated to understand how you were able to get that information. I know that's your, your metier, right, as a journalist, but how did you do it? There's just so much in there. Well, you know, it's obviously, it was the result of a big team of people over many years kind of chipping away at it. And so Billion Dollar Whale is kind of like the final, you know, narrative version of all of that work. You know, when we were, when we were reporting it in the Wall Street Journal, we were doing it bit by bit. You know, there was little bits of the scandal were, were being uncovered. And um, so anyways, the, the way that that project started was that my, my uh, journalistic partner, Tom Wright, he was the one that started the whole investigation long before I was involved. And, um, and, and this is something that's common at the Wall Street Journal. People sort of connect to a project when they have something to bring to it. And so you, you might find a big project suddenly has a very large team of people working on it from different angles. There's always one person kind of in charge, an editor. But I, I read that first couple of stories in the newspaper, and I, I was super interested in it. It just so happened that I had lived in Abu Dhabi for three years, and a big part of the scandal took place in Abu Dhabi. So I just immediately sort of jumped in with contacts, ideas, things that we could do to help make that story, uh, to reveal that part of the story. And um, Tom and I just hit it off so well, and we started to have a lot of success working together that it just became, uh, him and I became the lead reporters on everything to do with that scandal. And uh, at the time, I had, a, I had a day job at the Wall Street Journal covering the exchanges and market structure and high-frequency trading, and they just said, you can just stop doing all that stuff now, and you just do 1MDB. So I just did 1MDB for a couple of years, to be honest. And... Um, you know, just, just to answer your question a little bit more clearly, a story like that it, over so many years, the information has to keep coming from new places. So, you know, in the early days, there was, there was obviously leaks that helped us piece together the story. You know? maybe, maybe we should stop just for a second, because I'm not sure, just for our audience, what, what was the, in a nutshell, what was the one MDB scandal? So the 1MDB scandal was this enormously ambitious fraud that the combined aspects of a pyramid scheme with a klept kleptocratic state. And essentially, Malaysia created a new sovereign wealth fund, but instead of having savings, which you typically think of a sovereign wealth fund, they were borrowing money. So they borrowed an enormous amount of money, and this guy called Joe Lo, who was at the center of the whole fraud, stole that money in a variety of ways and then went on um, one of the greatest spending sprees of all time. And, and, then, and then as things, as the, the, the wall started closing in on him, he started trying to manufacture a kind of 
fake history for this money. And then later on, when the FBI was chasing him, he started trying to influence the U.S. political system to get the case dropped. So it's it was one of those stories where it just kept having new chapters, you know. And uh, and the scale of it was it was what by the by the end it was eight or or nine billion dollars that was that went missing. Yeah, I think that's kind of the the most up to date number. For a long time, people would say there was a more than five billion dollar scandal, but. More recently, some of the lawyers have pieced together other aspects of it that made the number grow. Uh, and, uh, and and just to give um, people, a, again, a, a sense for the scale of what you accomplished, you, you revealed politi- political corruption in Malaysia, for sure, but not just Malaysia, in the Middle East, in the U.S. Uh, you revealed corruption in, in Hollywood, in the art world, in the world of sovereign wealth funds generally, um, uh, you implicated uh, uh, appropriately Western banks and investment banks. The use, the the infiltration of Western democracies like the U.S., where money was poured into the political system through 501c3 and c4 organizations, international accounting firms, and what I really want to get to uh, later uh, is the use of lawyer trust accounts, which is a new one to me. So I'm for me. The, you know, you basically peeled back uh, the veil on basically every Western institution, every international institution. And when you're talking about having access to information, you're you're really what I think you're saying is that you have to have inroads into all those institutions at very high levels to get the kind of detail you got. Yeah, I think it's as as the case developed and as we found new components of the fraud and of the complicity of these institutions, it was it became a new reporting challenge. You had to figure out how are we going to get into that institution? How are we going to find the documentation? How are we going to pressure them to give us an answer to why this happened? You know, so it wasn't one of those sometimes there's a scandal and it has a set of leaks and then that's it. You know, even like so take, take for example the Panama Papers, there was a big leak There was a lot of stories and then it kind of petered out. But in this case, I think because he he, was such an active, ongoing criminal act and it just didn't stop that we we were always trying to keep up with what was going on. And and that's why even to this day, you know, we started reporting it in 2015 and here we are today. We still are reporting on it all the time in our newsletter and on in other ways because it's just it's a never ending story. And Jolo, uh, who was the 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 perpetrator of the fraud, the architect of the fraud, uh, a charismatic guy who just knew how to get to people, to read people, to bribe them with whatever whatever currency appealed to them. In the case of Hollywood actors, it was the prospect of financing for their movies. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, the leaders of sovereign wealth wealth funds um, in the Middle East, it was it was money. But not least was the prime minister of Malaysia at the time. Uh, who was um, uh, actually one of the few people that actually went to jail in this whole saga. Should I be surprised that anybody went to jail at all? Well, in some ways, um, th- this was not the most sophisticated fraud of all time. They're, they're, the most sophisticated frauds haven't been discovered yet. They're so well constructed and concealed. You know, Joe Lowe started this whole fraud when he was in his 20s. And he was he really started off as a not very good money launderer. He left a lot of trails that were not that hard to uncover. If a journalist can uncover uh, a money laundering scheme, then something went wrong. You know, even even the investigators in the U.S. government, um, some of them have told me that actually following the money in this case wasn't the hardest thing that they've ever done because there was so many sloppy a- aspects of it. But over time, he got better and better at it. So. To this point in time, there's still money missing, and it's actually kind of disappeared in, into the into the global financial system. He managed to do it, you know. Um, so, uh, so in that sense, it's not surprising people got arrested and, and went to jail because it was actually more easy to prove. And in the case of Najib, he actually didn't get convicted and imprisoned for the the whole fraud. It was a very narrow piece of it that took place in Malaysia, so it didn't even require. Um, mutual legal assistance treaty requests and stuff because it all happened in the Malaysian system. So it was very easy for them to prove. Again, that's the sloppiness of the characters involved. If they had done it in the way that, say, a very um, sophisticated Russian organized crime unit would do, there would be no way to prove it in the way that that you can prove these cases. Um, But 
And, and, and also the other thing is there would be no convictions at all if it wasn't for the fact that the U.S. Department of Justice has a very um, expansive view of jurisdiction, right, which is a, a common theme of the Southern District and the Eastern District of New York, is they, they can find a, a reason to always have jurisdiction over these cases, even if most of the criminal activity took place abroad, so long as it used U.S. dollars or it used data that traveled through Brooklyn, then they can essentially say that there's a reason for them to have a case. And there's no other place on earth that does that kind of thing. And, if it, and so it was, it was their effort that actually exposed all of the details and the inner workings of the fraud that made it possible for Malaysia and others to pursue their own cases. And yet there were, I mean, you, you probably have a cast of 50-odd uh, characters in, in Billion Dollar Whale, but only two, two went to jail, right? The, the foreign prime minister and a guy from Goldman Sachs. Is that right? Or did I miss some? There's a few more people that went to jail in Singapore. One guy went to jail in Switzerland. These are relatively minor characters uh, who, who in some ways probably unfairly took a bigger fall than their bosses because they were kind of left holding the bag. And even the Goldman Sachs, the, the most important Goldman Sachs character of all, um, Tim Leisner, hasn't been sentenced to prison and it's possible that because of his cooperation and, 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 other, and other aspects, he may never go to prison. It's not an amazing case when it comes to justice served in terms of people going to jail. Um, obviously, Joe Lowe himself is still at large. Someday he could face criminal prosecution if he gets captured somewhere. But um, to, to date, he hasn't. And I you know uh, Project uh, Brazen um, is trying to track Jolo. Uh, if anyone can track him down, you can. Um, I just want to, I, you know, one, there's a phrase uh, from your book you know, that describes, I think, what, what really happened here uh, in a beautiful way. It's the story of how sovereign states are monetized. For me, that's, um, uh, that's so important because even though the U.S. government has a lot of tools and has a lot of interest in, in uncovering uh, official corruption, the, the biggest, you know, some of the biggest characters in your book, the, the players in Abu Dhabi, uh, are scot-free. Uh, and in fact, have only, you know, their careers have only, um, uh, you know, progressed. They haven't really apparently been hurt by their affiliation with um, uh, or their relationship to WinMDB. Is that a particular problem of the Middle East? Is it a problem of uh, sovereign wealth funds? What's, how do you think about that? Clearly, in the case of the UAE, officials in government institutions are only accountable to the royal family. They're not accountable to the people of the country just by the way that it works. It's a kind of like an enlightened despotism is probably the most generous way to describe it. So the fact is the people, the higher ups in Abu Dhabi, the royal family, are are deeply embarrassed and in, in, in one case implicated, deeply implicated in the scandal. So for them to say, oh, there's a huge fraud and we're embarrassed and, and to fire people would be uh, worse than, than sort of ignoring it and pretending like it didn't happen. And we don't know what happened behind closed doors. There could have been money turned over to the government by certain people and things like that. But, but there's certainly no sense of justice in that portion of the whole fraud. In fact, there is, uh, going back to your idea about arrests, the, the kind of key figure in Abu Dhabi, who was the right-hand man of a sheikh called Sheikh Mansour, he is in prison. And also his right-hand man, an, an American citizen called Muhammad al-Husseini, is in prison. Um, but, but even that isn't, it hasn't been a legal process that would be considered um, robust by any means. They, they were sort of thrown in jail and, and the key was thrown away without any real discussion. You know, so I don't I don't think that they because if if there was a real judicial process, they would have found that the greatest beneficiary of the stolen money was a member of the royal family, not these guys. And so it is it is a kind of um, a thorny problem in this. And obviously, the Department of Justice is ultimately their their concerns can still be trumped by national security and and diplomatic concerns. So. The U.S. actually, um, I, I heard some great stories about this when they were putting together the, the indictment or the, sorry, the um, civil asset forfeiture that at the last minute, the State Department heard that they were going to name members of the Abu Dhabi royal family and they tried to intervene, but it was too late. It was just, just by luck. It was too late. And the State Department was ready to say, 
cut all those names out, it's, it will harm our <laughs> strategic interests, right? So it could have been even worse than it is now. It's, it's just breathtaking. How does this, um, how do you relate, um, and maybe you want to describe a bit about um, Blood and Oil, which is one of your projects on Project Brazen, and also People Like Us. Mm. Well, for me, like, Billion Dollar Whale was a, a defining moment for me because not only was it a huge investigative pro- project and we, we learned lots of tricks along the way, but a lot of the people we met became the sources for future stories. And, and to this day, I can trace so many of my projects back to Billion Dollar Whale in some way or another because it, maybe I met somebody along the way who then turned out to have information about other things. And that's sort of true about Saudi Arabia. So my second book, Blood and Oil, with, with my co-author called Justin Sheck, we, um, th- that started for me because a lot of, a lot of, there was a big Saudi component to 1MDB. And, and a big issue was that this new guy, Mohammed bin Salman, was in charge. And it was screwing up um, aspects of this fraud, which involved uh, the Abdullah family. King Abdullah died and the MBS took over. And they were struggling to keep their story straight and to kind of cover up the Saudi aspect of that. And a key figure from the 1MDB scandal turned out to be a key figure in the, in the, in the battle for power in Saudi Arabia. And so that's kind of how I got involved in that story. Um, and, you know, I, I lived in the Middle East for close to six years, and um, I just have a lifelong affection for the region and interest in it. And so, you know, blood and oil was, to me, the, you know, I'm, I'm, I have this absolute obsession with the Gulf and, and the way power works there and the kind of arcane dealings of these royal family members. So Blood and Oil to me was the ultimate example of getting into one of those stories. Obviously, the, the battle for power in Saudi Arabia is hugely consequential as well. And then people like us came out of, it's a podcast with um, the journalist Kim Gattas in Lebanon. And, and she's just a, an amazing journalist who I've always been a fan of. She has a, She wrote an amazing book called Black Wave. And I just wanted to find other ways to explain the Middle East to people without falling victim to cliches and overgeneralizations. So she she created this show that um, essentially interviewed people from the Arab world and didn't come into it with any kind of preconceptions. But your your point about the um, uh, the reaction of the U.S. government uh, to involvement of senior officials at the UAE uh, is a common is a common thread. I'm wondering if even how sovereign states are monetized is even maybe in the case of the Middle East, it's not even the right way to think about it. Maybe the right way to think about it is that, you know, it's the the state is the ruling elite. It doesn't it doesn't really exist away from that. And it's um, so in a way there's you know, if money is moved, it's not really stolen. It's just the it's the property of the elite and, and never the property of the, the people that live there. Yeah. I mean, you know, even in a place like Saudi Arabia, the law comes from the king. So the king can say all previous laws are now inverted and that's the law. So there's it's it's really important to realize that if you're in the Gulf countries, it's it's you know, they're they can be quite beautiful, ambitious architecture, everything. It can feel very safe. There's cameras everywhere. But the but the moment you realize that that Who's in charge is actually a delicate, fragile thing. And whoever's in charge controls all those cameras and controls all the aspects of the state. So it can quickly become menacing. And I I had this experience myself many times, even, for example, during the Arab Spring, being in a place like Bahrain, which was typically such a quiet, sleepy place. But it became, um, you know, a huge street protests. And, And suddenly all those cameras became very menacing and and all those police officers that were kind of milling around suddenly looked quite dangerous. And I had myself, I was detained in Bahrain, uh, just and I experienced that. And the, and the same thing also goes for Abu Dhabi, where I found out from this reporting project that my number, my phone number was on the list of targets of the Pegasus system, which mm-hmm. to, to use to infiltrate people's phones. It's, it's, it's kind of a mirage in a way. Now, I still love those places, but I, I, I have my eyes wide open about the risks of living there or even traveling there in general, um, especially if you're a journalist. So the, the, when the Middle Eastern elites um, take their cut, um, do they even go to the, the trouble of, of hiding the trail or is it just so open and notorious and, and part of the, the fabric of life that they don't have to bother doing that? I mean, are we talking about 
hiring Russian money launderers to uh, to do the right job, or do they just wire money to their accounts at uh, Coots? They, they don't really need. Um, th- just to take an example from one MDB, Sheikh Mansour, who's this, who's fabulously rich in ways that no one could even imagine, he was still looking for sources of cash because if you think about a rich Gulf royal, their allowance per se is quickly dissolves because they have so many ongoing expenses, you know, many hundreds of people and estates and planes and everything like that. So if you want to buy something new that's big, you need a new source of a big pot of cash. So what happened in this case was um, Sheikh Mansour wanted a new yacht, which was, which at the time was called the Topaz. And, and paying for this yacht was expensive because it was, I think it was a more than a half billion dollar yacht. And so what happened was this guy, his right-hand man, had a company that by all paper records was his company. And his company was paying the, the bills on this yacht. But everyone knows it was Sheikh Mansour's yacht, even if on paper it wasn't his yacht. So in a way, they have a great system, or at least in this example, it's a great system. It's kind of like a trust trustee relationship, but you don't even have to have paperwork because that right-hand man wouldn't dare do anything other than what he's told related to that yacht because he, he could be thrown in jail for life like he has actually, as that's what happened to the guy. Um, but, but it was kind of like an implied threat rather than a paperwork, like a trustee relationship. But I think that's, that's it. I think you find that a lot. It's people holding assets for the royals who wouldn't dare run away with it because they kind of fear they would lose their lives. So it's, it's, it's actually on paper quite effective. Um, and then, but there's also many examples where they just own things through the typical kind of offshore uh, companies and trusts and a chain of complicated uh, companies, and, and that happens too. One of the, one of the biggest, uh, you know, surprise. I mean, I'm a you know a, an aficionado of moving money, hiding money, stealing money, but I had never, um, and shame on me, I'd never focused on the idea that attorney trust accounts are actually the perfect vehicle for moving and hiding money. Could you, could you des- describe how those work uh, and how money is, is moved, hidden, and, and stolen using, using, actually, we're talking about not small-time lawyers, we're talking about big international law firms. Yeah, if you, if you think about it, let's say that you're receiving money from someone and you want to check that that money is clean. You, you don't have the ability to investigate the whole chain of previous transactions. You don't have the authority or the, even the time, the money. So you typically look at who has sent you the money. And, and that's, if, you, if the person's on a sanctions list, then, then that's a bad sign. If the entity that sends it to you is a well-known white shoe law firm, then you're going to basically say, okay, I don't have a problem here. I can just receive money from this law firm. They did the checks. So what, so what Joe Lowe did at one point in the fraud was he got all this money. It was completely stolen. It, it was in a, a Seychelles company with a Swiss bank account. But it would be hard to take money from this Seychelles company and pay for things because people would start asking questions. Where's, what's the source of this money? Because there are some requirements where you have to check. So instead, what he did was he transferred the money to a, a law firm in New York that deposited it into what's called an, an IOLTA account, which is meant to be, um, let's say you're going to buy a building. You transfer the money to your law firm. They hold it in this account. The reason it's called IOLTA is it's, it's interest that's, that's garnered from that is typically donated to um, like legal aid. It's like a way that legal aid is funded, which is actually an even more... Um, cynical aspect of this because you know if you say okay we're banning these accounts then you're essentially cutting off legal aid funding right. um so then and then that law firm just paid his bills aircraft charter nightclubs assets um rental payments it, it was completely not the way that these these trust accounts were meant to be used and um joe Lo became uh interested in this structure even later on in the fraud where he again found these accounts that were meant to temporarily hold money, but he convinced the banks to let him hold money there for a long time and pay bills from them. And so it's just, in, in general, what was nice about the 1MDB case for students of financial crime is that he really tried every single thing. And he, and he, and he so it's kind of like a, a barium meal through the financial system to see all the different <laughs> ways in which you can sneak around, you know? Another one that I really like in particular was at one point they, um, 
they deposited money in these what look like mutual funds in um, Curacao, but actually they're they're mutual funds that have a special share only for you. So you put the money in. So it's not mixed like you would think of a mutual fund. And then those mutual funds have a great service. They will then lend the money out the back door to wherever you want. So they just take a cut, you know, a little like a fee for this process. But it's essentially a, a completely clear money laundering technique. And so I, I loved learning about all these things, you know, in this case. So and, and is, the, is the process of using IOTA accounts still, um, is that still a good system? Is that still working for people? Well, I doubt that I, I would imagine that every law firm in America, at least when they saw what happened in this case with the law firm Sherman and Sterling, that they, they probably had the life scared out of them about using IOTA accounts in that way. Because if there was another case like that, clearly there would be a huge crackdown, right? If there's one case like that, maybe they can kind of, everyone can sort of say, oh, that was a, I was a, an unexpected, you know, uh, fool me, fool me once, fool me right? once, yeah. But, but you know, truthfully, in the in this whole system of financial crime, lawyers um, are really important for that because even bad actor lawyers are, are rarely prosecuted by the U.S. government. It's just too um, well. There's probably a few different things going on. One of them is a lot of people from the Department of Justice go and work in law firms after they finish their government service. So they don't want to burn any bridges. But also, it's just, it's also just tricky. It's kind of like, you know, like there's that old saying about going going to battle with journalists who buy uh, ink by the barrel. You you also don't really want to go after lawyers. It, it might be a losing game. You know, it might be hard to prove. You know, who are you going to flip in a case like that? And how are you going to get around the legal privilege of things and stuff? But, you know, Jolo was a, a huge user of law firms all around the world for all kinds of purposes. And some of them sounded to me like criminal activity. At one point, he um, needed to have a way to communicate with people that was undiscoverable by any authority. So this law firm set up this special server on like an island somewhere that doesn't have any kind of treaties. And that's how you could email Joe Lowe. It would go through that island server. You know, and that to me doesn't sound like providing a really robust defense of your client in court. It sounds like aiding and abetting to me. You know, it sure does sound like aiding and abetting. And uh, it, it seems to me that the once you get once you get in the door with a law firm in a, a completely legitimate transaction, right, pick that whatever it is. And, and the money is well traced and well sourced and you have a relationship with that law firm. Pretty much after that, I'll bet that money can just flow in and flow out of uh, trust accounts. Um, and you've got that law firm on tap doing transactions for you. Uh, and there's no further due diligence. Uh, it just strikes me that it's, um, I mean, what do law firms do? I'm not saying that lawyers are inherently corrupt. I don't believe they are. But but your point about the undermoney involved, there is a revolving door of, of um, government officials and big time lawyers and big transactions. And and that's how that's how people make money. Yeah, I agree. Bradley, um, your, your most recent book, Rebel in the Kingdom, describes the process by which North Korean ambassadors around the world are essentially running their own criminal gangs uh, because they don't have any money coming out of, uh, you know, the, the mothership. So they've got to figure out ways to make things work. Uh, and presumably they keep their jobs because they're able to uh, funnel money back to senior officials uh, in North Korea. What sort of things do those ambassadors get up to? And maybe you could tell us a bit more about the plot to uh, uh, to essentially overthrow the the, the um, uh, North Korean government. It's quite a it's quite a saga. Yeah, I mean, th again, this kind of goes to the idea of like wherever there's a weakness, that's where people take advantage. So, because they're diplomats and they have diplomatic immunity, nobody can go into their embassies. They can do. They, it's actually a great way to run a criminal operation. Um, so the North Korean state needs foreign currency for for its economy, but also just for the kind of the good times of the ruling family, you know, things that they want to buy. I mean, famously, Kim Jong-un's dad was one of the greatest buyers of Hennessy, like a special kind of Hennessy on, on the planet. Um, he needed foreign currency to buy that. So they and, and it's actually quite banal what they do. They're not they're not like um, a mafia organization with, you know, really sophisticated operators. They did things for example, counterfeiting U.S. currency. They, um, they sold counterfeit cigarettes, you know, really low quality cigarettes with high quality uh, packaging. Any kind of, even kind of 
relatively low revenue businesses, it was still worth doing because they, because every little bit counts for North Korea. Um, they also ran a lot of um, hacker networks. You know, those hacker networks are not in North Korea. They're North Koreans that are overseen by the embassies abroad. And so it's, it's anything and everything that they could come up with, you know, and, and, and that might also include, for example, selling uh, military equipment to nations like Syria and other other people looking to buy cheap ammunition and guns and things like that. So it's a, it is it's quite a fast, everything about North Korea is fascinating because it goes against what everything you, you believe or everything you think if, if about how the world actually works. You know, it turns out that this little hermit nation can be hugely consequential in everything it does. You know, they, they managed to do some of the most brazen hacking. I, it's, it's kind of unbelievable that they were the best at counterfeiting um, U.S. currency for a long time. You know, they, they keep surprising people. But the book itself is um, about this particular character called Adrian Hong, who is a essentially an, a, a, a Korean-American, although technically he's Mexican because he was born there before he moved to America, who um, at Yale had a kind of awakening about North Korea and his, and his ancestry. And felt like th- this was the, the most important thing he could dedicate his life to, into helping North Koreans. And he started off kind of like a typical activist, you know, screening films and even like having bake sales. But over time, he kind of radicalized and believed that he, that, that ra- sort of more aggressive action was needed. And in the, in the, in the middle stages, that was helping um, North Korean escapees, people who went over the border into China, get out of China and into South Korea or to, to America. And then later on, it was much more ambitious efforts to help high profile um, uh, diplomats defect. And, and in defecting, creating a kind of government in exile that could, that could um, legitimately contest North Korea and, and, and whittle away at this idea of this inviolable royal, uh, kind of royal family, to, so in, in, in other words to say. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty crazy story because it's all true. And, and the kind of culminating uh, event was that this mission that went wrong in Spain that led this group to now be on the run, including the founder, who's, who's literally a fugitive from the U.S. Marshal Service who's trying to, to execute a warrant on behalf of the government of Spain. And, and just with the last note about that is the whole warrant is based on the idea that he tried to kidnap this diplomat, and that he was a violent assaulter of people in the embassy. But th- the crazy thing about it is that was what it was supposed to look like. It was like a movie set. You know, they had they they, they were trying to stage that that image to protect the family of that diplomat back in North Korea, where by tradition they punished three generations of a defector's family. And so it's it's a, it's, it's truly a tragic and and, and kind of ironic. Uh, case as well. So the guy, the guy that should be a hero to Western governments, Western law enforcement, um, Western civilization, ends up being the guy that uh, is uh, that they're looking for, and, and not the ambassador. This. Um, so I just want to ask you a bit about more about the the structure of of these embassies, because so North Korea probably has forty embassies around the world, maybe more. And is it safe to assume that every one of those embassies operates the same way? It's, um, it's dealing in low-level crime, smuggling, but also might be a home base for hacking? I think it's fair to say that with high probability, every North Korean embassy on Earth um, is, is, has a, a criminal underbelly to it. Um, though each one of them also has its own kind of characteristics, depending on where it is. You know, for example, the North Korean embassy in Italy has a big role in negotiating behind the scenes food aid, for example, because North Korea still relies on huge amounts of food aid from the United Nations and others. And that's done out of the Italian embassy, you know. Some some embassies have different, just have different work. I, I remember, for example, coming across the North Korean embassy in Libya, which was mostly a place where they were negotiating outsourced labor, slave labor, to Libyan government projects. Um, so, then, then, you know, obviously the, the North Korean delegation to the United Nations um, is probably the most important diplomatic kind of channel because there's no embassy for the North Korea in America, but there is this group that represent themselves of the United Nations. And so there's a lot of back channeling going on through that group, for example. So there's, they each have a kind of 
a role that's based on where they are, and they also have this kind of predilect, predilection towards criminal activity as well. How many other uh, countries you think operate the same way? How many other embassies around the world? I mean, we, we read periodically about Chinese and Russian um, diplomats being booted because they're actually spies, but, but there must be many, many more countries that use their embassies in the same fashion. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, to be to be honest, probably from the point of view of other countries, American embassies are also nefarious. You know, I used to live in Cairo and the American embassy is a gigantic building. It overlooks the entire city of Cairo and it has a giant radio dishes on the top. And it was always seen as a symbol of this kind of imperial overlord that's spying on us with all their equipment and everything like that. And probably, to be honest, there's some truth to that, you know. So so all embassies have a kind of hidden dimension to them in terms of espionage. And probably these smaller rogue states like Venezuela or North Korea and Iran um, have an even bigger portion of what they do is is what we would consider nefarious activities, you know. But you're right, it, it's, it's one of these other dimensions that exists in the world. And they have little funny things like diplomatic pouches. And even the idea of a diplomatic pouch is actually just a phrase because a diplomatic pouch can be a container. It doesn't have to be the size of a pouch, you know, so. I mean, it could be a container like like a, an intermodal, like a, a 40 foot long yeah. container, eight feet high by eight feet wide. Yeah, it can be quite big. It doesn't have to be an actual pouch. So it's just anything that the embassy puts a stamp on and says, that's my pouch. Yeah, no, of course, if, if uh, the, the government of Spain sees like 20 containers coming in for North Korea, they can, they can intervene. There's probably a way that they can check those or do something. But there's, there are limits to that. But at the same time, there's a lot that's going on. And, and there's, I, I'm always attracted to those stories, too, of, of these other dimensions where things are happening that affect the rest of us. There's a, there's a, I always use the phrase hidden worlds. There's hidden worlds, hidden dimensions where lots of things are happening that are consequential to us in the normal everyday life, but, in, but we don't quite understand how and why. So, um, so really what you're, I mean, it's, it's clearly your beat, hidden worlds, dark money, how governments operate. Is there any hope that um, what we would view as Western values and, uh, you know, stemming this tide of uh, political corruption, particularly as it, it, as it filters back into our system? Because one, one of the points you make... Um, graphically in Billion Dollar Whale is that uh, Joe Lowe's money went right back into, uh, into the U.S. You know, he was essentially suborning. He got movie stars and, and, uh, and models and uh, politicians to do his bidding. Uh, so it's not a, in, from our perspective, the, it's not a victimless crime that the rulers of Abu Dhabi or, uh, or Malaysia or anywhere else are doing what they do with their money. Um, uh, the, the money comes right back to affect what happens in the U.S. and in Western Europe. Yeah. I mean, I guess in other words, what you're saying is, is there any hope of pushing back against all of this bad activity in the world? And um, I have kind of two thoughts about it. One of them is even the so often journalists wonder, oh, is anything happening based on what I'm doing, what I'm writing, what I'm reporting? And um, I, I, re I realized in my career at the Wall Street Journal that even just naming a person as being connected or doing something in, in some way or another has immediate and often lifelong ramifications for that person. Because the banking system isn't technically set up to just facilitate crime. Like, I'm not so cynical as to think that. And they try to institute um, some safeguards to, to lower the risk on average. Um, there's always loopholes and people are finding new ways all the time. But so one of the ways they do that is they read the press and when they see a name that's connected to Joe Lowe, then that name now has a red flag on it forever. I mean, it's very hard to get the red flag removed. It's very consequential. That person can't just go open bank accounts anymore. They have to really prove things. So, so that's another way of saying maybe someone didn't go to jail, but their life got a lot harder as a result of the investigative work that's going on. And then also on the kind of bigger level of can we stop money laundering, can we stop crime and kleptocracy, I actually see it as a, maybe it's a, maybe in a way the forces of good are outgunned sometimes and out-resourced, but ultimately it does feel like a kind of push and pull. And in and, and the case of one of these example, like it was a very effective global investigation. Many countries, Singapore, Malaysia, Switzerland, 
the United States, some, to some extent UK, other places, they worked together to uncover this. And they made it hard to do the same thing again, the exact same thing. Maybe there'll be new innovations on it. Um, and, and one of the chief investigators on the FBI at one time told me that he always saw his job as being kind of a, a gardener. And he's just trying to kind of prune out these bad weeds and things. And he's not concerning himself whether or not he's going to win the battle. And he's just doing his job. And then somebody else will come in and it'll be their job and it'll keep going on. And... Um, that's just, there's, a, there's, a, there's a necessary role for people on that side of things. And I, 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 in this case in particular, I would always think to myself that there's all these FBI agents who are working on this around the clock. And they're just like getting on the train to go home and they have, they have normal lives. They're not, they, they weren't corruptible, you know, and it, and it made them so dangerous and so powerful compared to these characters in the 1MDB scandal who are constantly saying, like, I can't believe I can't get out of this. Like, I have all the money in the world. Why can't I just pay my way out of it? And, and, it, and it turned out they couldn't. So Joe Lowe was ultimately unsuccessful to do things like even influence the Trump administration. He tried everything he could. He spent tens of millions of dollars, if not hundreds, and it just didn't work, you know? So that gives me some hope, I guess. Yeah, it's um, some hope. You're, 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 one of the other things that uh, you're, you're um, featuring on Project Brazen these days is uh, Chinese, a Chinese-American uh, criminal who's uh, using something like the, it's called, you call it flying money, I think, uh, and a system that has dramatically reduced the cost to uh, Latin American drug cartels of laundering their money. Uh, that's, you know, that as you talk about um, people finding new ways to to commit crime all the time. Could you tell us how that works? Um, it's just it's just an amazing um, uh, and reducing the cost. And just to put it in perspective, by reducing the cost of laundering money from call it 18 or 20 percent to one or two percent, puts huge amounts of money uh, into the pockets of international drug dealers and human traffickers. Yeah. I mean, so we have a newsletter. It's called Whale Hunting, obviously inspired by Billion Dollar Whale. And we try to uh, keep an eye out for all these innovations and dark money and, um, in general, the, the kind of secret world of rich and powerful people and forces. And so, yeah, we had a, a post about this thing called Fei Xin or Flying Money. And essentially, it's the Chinese version of something that in America is more familiar with terrorism financing, the Hawala system, where money doesn't actually have to move. It just kind of goes up and down in piles on either side. And so, it, and I had no, didn't know this myself until recently, that, the, and these are, all, these are all practices that date back hundreds, if not thousands of years. They're ancient systems that, that um, are perfect for money laundering because no money actually has to transfer. There's no documents formed. It's all very trust-based um, you know, I, I remember sometimes, um, for example, wealthy Indian families that were trying to get money out of India would use the Hawala system to get the money into Dubai. And the only receipt, in a sense, is a single bill, a single rupee note that had a particular number on it. And then you, you show up on the other side with that number and they say, OK, here's your two million dollars or something like that. And you, you obviously pay a fee depending on the kind of supply and demand of transfers. So. Um, all around the world, there's things like this that are happening on huge scale. And even this idea of Hawala, it's, it's actually wrong to think of it as a terrorism financing thing. That's just kind of what made it famous. To this day, Hawala is used by rich people in France to get money to London if they just know the right people and they're part of the right network. So there's um, not just money that's coursing through the globe that's managing to keep itself disguised, but there's money that's moving in this way as well. And so I think it's really important to understand. So what it, mean, what it means is that currency regimes and, and regulation don't really don't really work. Um, how big how big are these? Um, let's call them under money systems. The, these Hawala system or or Chinese flying money in, in terms of scale. Do you have any sense for how big they might be? I would be wrong to kind of hypothesize too much, but it, it does feel like it's a multi billion dollar system for sure. You know. Um, and obviously, there's even you could even argue that aspects of cryptocurrency are just another format for that those kind of clandestine transfers. Especially when you 
look at these cryptocurrency transfers that they jump into one currency, then they jump into other currencies that don't have blockchains, then back into the blockchain. The, 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 some of the stuff around how Russian organized crime uses cryptocurrency is utterly fascinating. The way that these, and, and, there's, and there's always an entrepreneur who's willing to provide a service in that whole system. Because if you have cryptocurrency, you need to get it and turn it into dollars. It's, a, it's kind of a hard problem to solve. And there's all kinds of institutions that have popped up, secret criminal institutions, that they just solve that problem, you know? Solve the problem problem of moving dollars into crypto and moving dollars out of crypto. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and not through the typical system, not through, you know, having an account, uh, a brokerage account, you know, through one of these establishment brokerages. Essentially, they're like shadow banks that use a combination of physical currency and, and other techniques to move money in between and out of, of cryptocurrency. You know, if you're a, if you're a drug lord, you can't you can't just like have an account um, and then send money around. You know, it has, you have to use the infrastructure in a, in a raw way of, of cryptocurrency. So in the, in the, in the whole scheme of uh, the world that um, you describe and that you're, you're describing in your, in your books and at Project Brazen, what do you think about the international the sanctions that have been applied to Russia in particular? Uh, but it's not just Russia. It's Russia. It's North Korea. It's Cuba. It's Venezuela, Iran. Do they actually work? I mean, no sanction system will work 100 percent, but you're definitely making life difficult for those people. And they have to find all these other expensive systems to survive. You know, like North Korea is able to limp on despite all the sanctions, but it's not exactly thriving, you know. And they're, and they're constantly wishing they could get rid of the sanctions, but they, at the same time, they're not going to give up their nuclear weapons. So um, they have to find all kinds of other things. You know, I, I love all these stories about ghost ship to ship transfers of, of coal. And, you know, they have to do really complicated, expensive things and they keep getting rumbled and they have to come up with something new. You know, so it's it, is, it does cause harm to those countries. It does work in a sense, but it's not 100 percent effective. But because it still works for the people that are running the countries because they're, you know, they're um, uh, essentially pillaging. Yeah, there's a lot of this going on or is going on in Ukraine where uh, steel and grain are being stolen uh, and, and moved out by by one has to believe the Russian military uh, because the scale of that is just so vast. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's 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 happening all over the place. So, Bradley, if, if you wanted to, in a summary nutshell kind of way, encourage people that the world isn't completely dominated uh, by these forces of dark money. Can you make that case? Well, I think I would just say the fact that we know about this stuff is the first step towards, uh, you know, neutralizing it to some extent. You know, all these, there's a lot of institutions out there that are doing very important work, even if you haven't, even if most people don't read the work of the OCCRP, for example, um, this journalistic outfit based in Eastern Europe, they, they're doing very important work in exposing a lot of these networks and these characters. And it's at great risk to themselves. People from the OCCRP have gone to prison in places like Azerbaijan, but it has it does have an impact. They're not doing it for no reason, because, like I said before, just naming and shaming these characters is enough to make it that they have to spend huge amounts of money just to try to fight those uh, blockages. You know, if, if, you, if your bank calls you and says, hey, we're shutting down your account because we, it's too risky for us, it's actually pretty hard to fight that bank. You know, it's, 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 and, and, and then if one bank does it, lots of banks do it. So I think uh, that, that does give me hope that there's ways to make this very difficult for people. And they get, they, they get forced to live in places like Dubai and they can't go live in some place like New York or London because they just can't get away with it anymore. You know, so you're, we're, we're limiting in some ways you're limiting the spaces that they can operate within. And, um, it's not sh shutting it down, but it's definitely making them making life hard for those people. Yeah. Although maybe Dubai is not such a bad place to live, right? Well, yeah, right now it's a great place to live if you're a Russian oligarch or an Angolan, um, you know, kleptocrat but still it's it's the good thing is that they can't do that anywhere they want you know a lot of these people would much rather be in los angeles 
or New York or London or Paris, but they can't do it. So that's a good thing. So you have to wonder, is that a generational thing? So that the, um, the criminal fortunes are made by this generation uh, and then they're structured in ways that uh, the, the future generations are going to be able to live in those places uh, and the money will, by then will be completely clean. Mm. Yeah, it could be. It could be. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a monumental task. This is actually the way I think about all this money is it's kind of like, you know, in astrophysics, you hear about dark matter. It's all this matter in the universe and it, it affects everything that's going on in the universe, but we can't see it or even really detect it. And that's the same thing that goes with dark money. Dark money is all over the place, hidden in different ways, and it's influencing us in so many ways that it, it's, it's really an important task to try to understand and detect it, you know, and, and to limit it. Because, because who knows what the consequence could be if it grows enough that it can sort of rival the, the light system, then you know, bad things could start happening in more places, I think. You know, I think it's, it's definitely a, a light versus dark battle that's going on. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's, the, um, that's why your work is so important, because unless people understand how, I mean, I call it obviously under money, but um, because it's the it's same, it's dark money, it's under money, money that influences people and events, but you don't really, you can't really see it, but you know it's there. Uh, and I think unless people understand much more about how the world really works, um, how the sovereigns uh, really work, uh, and how government officials really operate, um, we'll never make any progress. Um, and we need to make progress here to keep the lights on. Definitely. Bradley, I really, I can't thank you enough. This is, this is just, it's such a, a pleasure for me. Um, I'm a huge fan of, of all your work. Um, I probably should spend less time reading um, uh, all your and listening to all your podcasts, but they're just so stunningly brilliant that I can't. Uh, so you've got me hooked, and I hope other people will get hooked as well. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. No, feelings mutual. 